Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us tonight's story. It is March, and we are reading Irish fairy tales and folklore this month of March. Tonight's story is Daniel O'Rourke. This is a story or translation by T. Crofton Croker. The story is Daniel O'Rourke. People may have heard of the renowned adventures of Daniel O'Rourke, but how few are there who know that the cause of all his perils, above and below, was neither more nor less than his having slept under the walls of the Puka's Tower. I knew the man well. He lived at the bottom of Hungry Hill, just at the right-hand side of the road as you go down toward Bantry. An old man was he. At the time he told me the story, with gray hair and a red nose, and it was on the 25th of June, 1813, that I heard it from his own lips as he sat smoking his pipe under the old poplar tree on as fine an evening as ever shone from the sky. I was going to visit the caves in Dursey Island, having spent the morning in Glengariff. I am often asked to tell it, sir, he said he so that this is not the first time. The master's son, you see, had come from beyond foreign parts in France and Spain, as young gentlemen used to go before Bonaparte, or any such was heard of. And sure enough, there was a dinner given to all the people on the ground, gentle and simple, high and low, rich and poor. The old gentlemen were the gentlemen after all, saving your honor's presence. They'd swear at a body a little, to be sure, and maybe give one a cut of a whip now and then, but we were no losers by it in the end, and they were so easy and civil, and kept such rattling houses and thousands of welcomes, and there was no grinding for rent, and there was hardly a tenant on the estate that did not taste of his landlord's bounty often and often in a year. But now it's another thing. No matter for that, sir, for I'd be better be telling you my story. Well, we had everything of the best, and plenty of it, and we ate, and we drank, and we danced, and the young master, by the na- by the same token, danced with Peggy Barry from the Bohirden. A lovely young couple they were. They were uh, are they are both low enough now. To make a long story short, I got, as a body may say, the same thing as tipsy almost, for I can't remember ever at all, no ways how it was I left the place. Only I did leave it, that's certain. Well, I thought for all that in myself I'd just step to Molly Cronahan's, the fairy woman, to speak a word about the bracket heifer that was bewitched. And so, as I was crossing the stepping stones of the ford of Ballyhay-Sorheno, and was looking up at the stars and blessing myself, for why, it was Lady Day, I missed my foot, and so as I fell into the water. Death alive, thought I, I'll be drowned now. However, I began swimming, swimming, swimming away for the dear life, till at last I got ashore, somehow or other. But never the one of me can tell you how, upon a dissolute island. I wandered and wandered about there, without knowing where I wandered, until at last I got into a big bog. The moon was shining as bright as day, or your fair lady's eyes, sir, with your pardon for mentioning her. And I looked east and west, and north and south in every way, and nothing did I see but bog, bog, bog. I could never find out how I got into it, and my heart grew cold with fear, for sure and certain I was that it was by my barren place. So I sat down upon a stone, which as good luck would have it, was close by me, and I began to scratch my head and sing the Orlegong. When all of a sudden the moon grew black, and I looked up, and I saw something for all the world, as if it was moving down between me and it, and I could not tell what it was. Down it came with a pounce, and looked at me full in the face, and what was it but an eagle? As fine a one as ever flew from the kingdom of Kerry. So he looked at me in the face, and says he to me, Daniel O'Rourke, says he, how do you do? Well, very well, I thank you, sir, says I. I hope you're well, wandering out of my senses all the time how an eagle came to speak like a Christian. What brings you here, Dan, says he. 
Nothing at all, sir, says I. Only I wish I was safe home again. It is out of the islands you want to go, Dan, says he. It is, sir, says I. So I up and told him how I had taken a drop too much and fell into the water, how I swam to the island, and how I got into the bog and did not know my way out of it. Dan, says he, after a minute's thought, thought it, though it was, though it's very improper for you to get drunk on Lady Day, yet as you are a decent, sober man, who tends mass well, and never flings stones at me or mine, nor cries out after us in the fields, my life for yours, says he. So get on my back and grip me well for fear you'd fall off, and I'll fly you out of the bog. I'm afraid, says I, your honor's making game of me, for who ever heard of riding a horseback on an eagle before? Upon the honor of a gentleman, says he, putting his right foot on his breast. I am quite in earnest, and so now either take my offer or starve in the bog. Besides, I see that your weight is sinking the stone. It was true enough, as he had said, for I found the stone every minute going from under me. I had no choice, so thinks I to myself. Faint heart never won fair lady, and this is fair persuadance. I thank your honor, says I, for the loan of your civility, and I'll take your offer kind. I therefore mounted upon the back of the eagle, and held him tight enough to by the throat, and him uh, and up he flew in the air like a lark. Little I knew the trick he was going to serve me. Up, 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 God knows how far up he flew. Why then, said I to him, thinking he did not know the right road home. Very civilly, because why, I was in his power entirely. Sir, says I. Please, your honor's glory, and with humble submission to your better judgment, if you'd fly down a bit, you're now just over my cabin, and I could be put down there, and many thanks to your worship. Ah, Don, said he, do you think me a fool? Look down in the next field, and don't you see two men and a gun? By my word, it would be no joke to be shot this way, to oblige a drunken blackguard that I picked up off a good stone in a bog. "'Bother you,' said I to myself, but I did not speak out, for there was what was the use. "'Well, sir, up he kept, flying, flying, and I asking him every minute to fly down, and all to no use. "'Where in the world are you going, sir?' says I to him. "'Hold your tongue, Dan,' says he. "'Mind your own business, and don't be interfering with the business of other people.' "'Faith, this is my business, I think,' says I. "'Be quiet, Dan,' says he. So I said no more. At last, where should we come to but to the moon itself? Now you can't see it from this, but there is, or there was in my time, a reaping hook sticking out of the side of the moon. This way, drawing the figure thusly. On the ground, with the end of a stick. Dan, says the eagle. I'm tired with this long fly. I had no notion to us so far. And my lord, sir, said I, who in the world axed you to fly so far? Was it I? Did not I beg and pray and beseech you to stop half an hour ago? There's no use talking, Dan, said he. <clears throat> I'm tired bad enough, so you must get off and sit down on the moon until I rest myself. Is it sit down on the moon, said I? Is it upon that little round thing, then? Why, then, sure, I'd fall off in a minute, and be kilt and split and smashed all to bits. You are a vile deceiver, so you are. Not at all, Dan, said he. You can catch fast hold of the reaping hook that's sticking out of the side of the moon, and will keep you up. I won't, then, said I. Maybe not, said the quiet, said he. Quiet, quiet. If you don't, my man, I shall give you a shake and one slap of my wing and send you down to the ground where every bone in your body will be smashed as a small as a drop of dew on a cabbage leaf in the morning. Why, then, I'm in a fine way, said I to myself, ever to have come along with the likes of you, and so giving him a hearty curse in Irish, for fear he know what I said, I got off his back with a heavy heart, took hold of the reaping hook, and sat down upon the moon, and a mighty cold seat it was, I can tell you that. When he had me there, fairly landed, he turned about on me and said, Good morning to you, Daniel O'Rourke, said he. 
I think I've nicked you fairly now. You robbed my nest last year. It was true enough for him, but how he found it all out is hard to say. And in return, you are freely welcome to cool your heels, dangling upon the moon like a cockthrow. Is that all? And is this the way you leave me, you brutes, you? Says I, you ugly unnatural baste. And is this the way you serve me at last? Bad luck to yourself with your cooked nose, and to all your breed, you blackguard. Twas all to no manner of use. He spread out his great big wings, burst out a laughing, and flew away like lightning. I bawled after him to stop, but I might have never saw from him that day to this. Sorrow fly away with him. You may be sure I was in disconsolate condition, and kept roaring out for the bare grief, when all at once a door opened right in the middle of the moon, creaking on its hinges as if it had not been opened for a month before. I suppose they never thought of greasing em, and out there walks, who do you think, but the man in the moon himself, and I knew him by his bush. Good morning to you, Daniel O'Rourke, said he. How do you do? Very well, thank you, your honor, said I. I hope your honor is well. What brought you here, Dan, said he. So I told him how I was a little overtaken in liquor at the master's, and how I was cast out on a desolate island, and how I lost my way down in the bog, and how the thief of an eagle promised to fly me out of it, and now instead of that he had flew me up to the moon. Dan, said the man in the moon, taking a pinch of snuff when I was done, you must not stay here. Indeed, sir, says I, tis much against my will I'm here at all, but how am I to go back? That's your business, said he. Dan, mine is to tell you that here you must not stay, so be off in less than no time. I'm doing no harm, says I, only holding on hard by the reaping hook, lest I fall off. That's what you must not do, Dan, says he. Pray, sir, says I, may I ask how many you are in family that you would not give a poor traveller lodging? I'm sure it is not so often your trouble with strangers coming to see you, for tis a long way. I'm by myself, Dan, says he, but you'd better let go the reaping hook. Faith and with you leave, says I. I'm not let go the grip, and the more you bids me, the more I won't let go. So I will. So had better, Dan, says he again. Why then, my little fellow, says I, taking the whole weight of him with my eye from the head to foot, there are two words to that bargain, and I'll not budge, but you may ask if you like. We'll see how that is to be, says he, and went back he went, giving the door such a great bang after him, for it was plain he was huffed, that I thought the moon and all would fall down with it. Well, I was preparing myself to try strength with him, when back again he comes with the kitchen cleaver in his hand, and without saying a word he gives two bangs to the handle of the reaping hook that was keeping me up, and whap it came in two. Good morning to you, Dan, says the spiteful little old blackguard, when he saw me clinging, cleanly falling down with a bit of handle in my hand. I thank you for your visit and fair weather after you, Daniel. I had not time to make any answer to him, for I was tumbling over and over and rolling and rolling, eight at the rate of a fox hunt. God help me, says I, but this is a pretty pilgrim for a decent man to be to seen in a time like th of the night. I am now sold fairly. The word was not out of my mouth, when whiz, what should fly by close to my ear but a flock of wild geese, all the way up from my own bog a Baliaciano. Else how should they know me? The old gander, who was in their general, turning about his head, cried out to me, Is that you, Dan? The same, said I, not a bit daunted now at what he said, for I was by this time used to all kinds of bedevilments, and besides I knew him of old. Good morning to you, he says. Daniel O'Rourke, how are you in health this morning? Well, very well, sir, says I. I thank you kindly, drawing my breath, for I was mightily in want of some. I hope your honour is thy same. I think tis falling you are, Daniel, says he. You may say that, sir, says I. And where are you going all the way so fast, said the gander? 
So I told him how I had taken a drop, and how I came on the island, how I lost all my way in the bog, and how the thief and eagle flew me up in the moon, and how the man in the moon turned me out. Damn, says he, I'll save you. Put out your hand and catch me by the leg, and I'll fly you home. Sweet is your hand in a pitcher of honey, my jewel, says I, though all the time I thought within myself that I don't much trust you. But there was no help, so I caught the gander by the leg, and away I and all the other geese flew after him as fast as hops. We flew and we flew and we flew, until we came right over the wild ocean. I knew it well, for I saw Cape Clear to my right hands, sticking up out of the water. Ah, my lord, says I to the goose, for I thought it best to keep a civil tongue in my head anyway. Fly to land, if you please. It is impossible, you see, Dan, said he, for a while, because you see we are going to Arabia. To Arabia, said I, that's surely some place in foreign parts far away. Oh, Mr. Goose, why then, to be sure, I'm a man to be pitied among you. Whist, whist, you fool, said he, hold your tongue. I tell you, Arabia is a very decent sort of place, as like West Carberry, as one egg is like another, only there is a little more sand there. Just as we were talking, a ship hove in sight, scuttling so beautiful before the wind. Ah, then, sir, said I, will you drop me on the ship, if you please? We are not fair over it, said he. If I drop you now, you would go splash into the sea. I would not, says I. I know better than that, for it is just clean under us, so let me drop now at once. If you must, you must, said he. There, take your own way. And he opened his claw, and fit he was right. Sure enough, I came down plump into the very bottom of the salt sea. Down to the very bottom I went, and I gave myself up then forever. When a whale walked up to me, scratching himself after his night's sleep, and looked me full in the face, and never the word did he say, but lifting up his tail, he splashed me all over again with the cold salt water, till there wasn't a dry stitch upon my whole carcass. And I heard somebody saying, "'Twas a voice I knew, too. "'Get up, you drunken brute, off of that!' "'And with that I woke up, and there was Judy, "'with a tub full of water, "'but she was splashing all over me. "'For rest her soul, though she was a good wife, "'she never could bear to see me and drink, "'and had a bitter hand of her own. "'Get up!' she said again, "'and of all places in the parish, "'where no place sorry of you, "'your turn to lie down upon, "'but under the old walls of the Carigapuka, an easy resting, I am sure you had of it. And sure enough I had, for I was fairly bothered out of my senses with eagles, and men of moons, and flying ganders, and whales driving me through bogs, and up to the moon, and down to the bottom of the green ocean. If I was in drink ten times over, long would it be before I lie down in the same spot again. I know that. Daniel O'Rourke, thank you so much for listening. Have a good night, everybody.